to Dr. Fred Bilo, a professor of crop physiology in the Department of uh, Crop Sciences here at the University of Illinois. He, of course, recognized uh, he is an expert on agronomy and factors limiting corn and soybean production. He has received numerous awards for his teaching, extension, and research excellence, and he is a fellow of the American Society of Agronomy. Based on his research, he developed the Seven Wonders of the Corn Yield World. And I, don't you think the Seven Wonders of the Corn uh, World should be a country song. I'm thinking somebody should be writing that. And the six secrets of soybean success as tools to teach farmers and ag professionals the value of their crop management decisions. Let's welcome Dr. Fred Bilo. Hey, uh, can you hear me? Thank you so much. Look at my, uh, look at my long, nasty title there, which basically means I'm going to try and make nitrogen use on corn better. Now, now, why do I care about that? Nitrogen is the factor that has the biggest impact on corn productivity. And I don't have to tell you that the economic cost for a grower to under-fertilize is pretty high. So um, my goal is, how are we going to use nitrogen to get more yield uh, out of it? So uh, I'm going to talk about our NREC project, and I'm uh, actually going to talk about uh, a project by, uh, by this guy. This is uh, now Dr. Eric Winans. He was a PhD student with me at the time, and this is actually his project. He put the proposal together, so what we did was a, a chapter of his PhD thesis. Kind of happy that he's not here, because he'd do one a hell of a lot better job telling you this than I'm going to. Um, so uh, now the uh, farm manager, I think he's managing the Discovery and Innovation Center at Brant, and I just learned he's on the NREC board uh, representing the retailers as well, so I'm pretty proud of that. By the way, Graduate students, trained graduate students. That's our laboratory's product. So uh, th thanks to NRAC funding some of our students, this has helped us train students. That's how we do our research. And, and so uh, if you look here, you know, t by the way, it takes five years to get a PhD. So Dr. Winans was here for, for five years. Uh, you know, I, I don't think that's his first year, but there he is there. He pops up over there. I think he's somewhere over here. And then he ultimately graduates. So uh, I, I know I have at least two of my current students here, and I, I know one or two former ones. Pretty proud of those. That's how we do our research. So I, I'm going to show you research that we do at, uh, at, at several places in Illinois. So you know uh, the land of Lincoln, long state north to south, 351 miles. And oh boy, does the soil and the inherent soil fertility change as you go from the north to the south. So uh, the, this is where we do our research sites. Uh, I'm going to show you data that comes from these, these sites. Um, and, uh, and you know, I'm showing you a general average here. Right? Um, you know, sometimes, uh, sometimes it changes. We, we sample soil on every, and on every trial. But, but what I'm trying to show you is, in general, in the north, in Yorkville, we have a higher percent organic matter, a higher CEC, and a higher level of base soil fertility than we do in Champaign and than we do in the south. In other words, the fertility declines as you go south. Now, I got, I, got a, I got to acknowledge my farm collaborators. I have fantastic farm collaborators that we work with in the south and the north. Thanks to Danny Bartlin and the Stewart Farms in the, in the north. Couldn't do the work without them. So, you know, when we're doing our nitrogen work, we want this kind of variation. Variation in soil type to start with. What we don't want is variation due to equipment. So we run the same research equipment at all sites. We got some pretty sweet research equipment. All right, so there's my research equipment. We're getting ready to go to one of the sites. I mean, boy, you don't want to be stuck behind us on a two-lane road when we're going to a research site. 78 tires have to actually work. That's not including the spares to get this equipment to the site and to do the research. I mean, we're bringing everything with us. I'll show you our, our liquid toolbar. There's our banding fertilizer. I mean, we got, we got everything. We're, we're bringing seed, fertilizer. We bring everything. We even bring this important piece of equipment. I mean, the, the equipment's powered by diesel. Students powered by caffeine. And, and we learned the hard way that if you plug that uh, coffee maker into the 12-volt outlet of your 450 truck, 
it might smoke and spark and you, you might end up with a new 450 truck. So not, now we bring that generator. So um, I told you, we, we, with this equipment, we do what I'm going to call replicated small plot research. And we're pretty good at it, so I'll show you our, uh, our southern site here. This is Nashville, Illinois. And in that 20 acres with this equipment, we put in 11 different trials. And we can be pretty good at it. Let's look at right to the row. I'm sure that's a nitrogen trial. In fact, I think it's the NREC trial. <laughs> and we can do it right, right, right to the row. So this is our southern site. And honest to God, that, that's uh, the soil down there. I mean, it's not a, par it's not a gravel parking lot. That's, that's soil. I mean, if you're in southern Illinois, you know, you're two weeks away from a drought. So this is where we do our research. Now, now before I get to the NREC project, I, I feel compelled to try and teach you a little something about how corn uses nitrogen. I mean, how are we going to make it better, right, if we don't sort of know how it uses it, right? So I'm going to do a little education um, that leads up to the trial that we did with NREC. And I'm going to try and engage you a little bit. My first question is, uh, where does corn get its nitrogen from? All right, two, two, you have two choices. So the nitrogen the corn uses can come from the soil, you know, mineralization, or the fertilizer. Now, now I know it, 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 there's a debate on how much one source provides over another, but I'm going to tell you, roughly equal. So roughly it's 50-50. I get half my end from the soil, I get the other half from the fertilizer. Now, I want to pose another question to you. Hey, uh, how about a third source? Do you think a third, so a third source would be nice? What if I could get a little bit of it from the air? It's sort of like what soybean does. You know, these are these new nitrogen-fixing biological products that are on the market. And I'm posing this question to you. Would, would they be a help? I will guarantee you there is a place in every field where the soil lets me down, in other words, it doesn't supply its half. Or the fertilizer lets me down, doesn't supply its half. And if I just had a third source, a little bit from the air, that'd go a long way. That's what these new nitrogen fixing bacterial products do. Now I know, I know, you know, it's easy to say they don't work, but we need these products as a third source. And so I, you know, I think we need to be working on how to make these fit into a fertilizer practice, and then maybe we could reduce fertilizer loss. Well, I'm not going to talk about that, but uh, you can see I'm passionate about it. Uh, I got another question for you, and, and this is, you know, in my education of how corn uses nitrogen. So my, my question is, you know, when in the life cycle of, of corn is nitrogen is absorbed, and, and then how does it use it? I mean, what does it do with it? That, that's called partitioning. Now, I'm happy to say I know this because this is a, probably my best cited paper. Uh, we published this all, over 10 years now, um, you know, the uptake in partitioning of corn. I, I know you're sick to death of seeing this, but I'm, I'm contractually bound to show it to you. So, and now we looked at all nutrients, right? Now, not just nitrogen. And guess what? They're not all used in the same time or the same way. I'm just going to focus on nitrogen here. And let me do a little close-up here. And with this graph, I'm going to show you some important aspects about how corn uses nitrogen and what's the target for improvement. So if you look at this, if you look at this graph right here, what I see, this is for 230 bushel corn. You know, it's averaged over a bunch of hybrids and locations. 230 bushel corn. And I see that 230 bushel corn crop has to accumulate 260 pounds of that over the course of the season. Now, remember I told you, half of that comes from the soil. So I did the math, you know, the other half is the 130 from the fertilizer, right? Now, now, I know that, that, that this work was done with unlimited N. So, you know, 200 pounds of N put on, just to make sure. So if we put 200 pounds of N on, I got 130 of it in from the fertilizer, that represents efficiency of about 65%. And that is about right when it comes to nitrogen fertilizer. You get about two-thirds of what you put down in the plant in that year. So, uh, you know, this is some basic knowledge, right? Now, I want to tell you, hey, when's the sweet spot? When is it really going to crank up? 
Well, it's right there, you know, right, right there at vegetative growth. So that, that's when the rapid uptake occurs. No, notice why that's so important. I mean, we're making the business end of the plant, the leaf, the stem. So if I look at this graph here, you know, um, and I separate it into vegetative and reproductive, right, that's all one. Right, this side's vegetative, this side's reproductive. What I can see is when the crop flowers, it's got 75% of its nitrogen in it. I mean, this varies, of course, by hybrid and year, but this is what we generally see. Three quarters of the end, vegetatively. So 200 pounds vegetatively, 60 pounds during grain fill. Still got to have some, 25%. And that 25% I need during grain fill, that's for the air, right? That's for the grain. That's this blue part. See, I modeled this, right, with lines. And I'm showing you that this post-flowering and uptake, 60 pounds, that is not enough to meet the needs of the grain. So where does the end come from? The leaves. It's called remobilization. And this, this is a curse with, with lots of that. See, see how now, since I've got to meet the grain needs, I'm taking it out of the leaf. At the expense of leaf health. Now, now by the way, if it's deficient in that, this is even worse. All right, so uh, but let, me, let me summarize a few things here. And I've already alluded to this. But I know that this, uh, I know that this 230 bushel crop has to take up 260 pounds of N over the course of the season. So this allows me to calculate a production coefficient. Pounds per, of nitrogen uptake per bushel, 1.1 pounds. I mean, that's what the plant has to accumulate. Now, I can also calculate how much is removed with the grain. That's that blue part. I removed 0.64 pounds per bushel. I want you to notice that the amount that it takes up and the amount it removes, there's a big difference there. Where's that leftover on? In the stover. I mean, if you're going to use nitrogen use efficiency as the amount removed, you're never going to improve that. I mean, you're, you're lucky to just get it in the plant, have it in the stover afterwards. All right, so back to this graph here. All right, and this is sheer genius. I wish I had thought of this. It's not me. It's actually one of my PhD students. He's here. So he looked at this graph, and he said, hey, uh, what, what if we integrate the area under this curve? That, that, that's called calculus. Remember calculus? I could never think of any useful reason to do it. But here it is. What, what if I take this area under the curve, and I integrate that? And that would allow me to calculate the daily rate of uptake. All right, Marcus Lohman did that with the original data, and that's what it looks like. And, and not only do, can we tell you the daily rate of uptake, but we can do it by growth stage. And we drew some nice pictures, you know, to show you what's, what the plant looks like at each of those stages. If you look at this, like all growth plotted over time, you can divide this into three areas. All right, initial growth, peak uptake, late season. Notice they're all characterized by a difference in the rate of uptake. So I'm, I'm going to show you how important this is. And I'm going to start at the beginning. And I'm going to say, well, let's go to this initial part here. And it doesn't look like we need very much, you know. That would be wrong. By the way, the corn plant senses its nitrogen from a very early age. And it sets the potential. If you don't have another, enough nitrogen at the beginning, you will not set the potential. So I, this is an opportunity. I mean, who knows? Maybe, may, maybe I could get some soil test to tell me what's available. Maybe I could get a biological that would supply some in and trick the plant into thinking more was available. Or maybe I could put some with the planter. Maybe if I put it with a planter, planting a little goes a long way. That's the focus of our NREC project. All right, but um, you know, the question is how much? How much nitrogen do I need there to set the maximum yield potential? I will tell you if you broadcast the nitrogen, I'm not going to have time to show this to you. If you broadcast the nitrogen, you need about half of it up front to set the potential. So pretty important time, even though it's slow rate of uptake. Where's the real important time? Right there, peak uptake. You know why? Because I'm making the business end of the plant, the leaves in the developing air. I mean, look at that rate of uptake there. I mean, over seven pounds of N per day. That's not the time to be short of N. 
that is the most important period in nitrogen uptake by corn. Why? Why is this the most important time? Well, you're making the business end of the plant, the, leave in the, the leaves, but the real reason is peak uptake is directly related to yield. You cannot increase yield without increasing the peak uptake. What we've done here is we model different yields, peak uptake for different yields. Notice a huge difference in yield almost twice. It doesn't really matter at the beginning or the end. It's the peak uptake that matters. And guess what? If that end is not available to meet peak uptake, yield drops. This is the most important time. Now, I told you that uh, corn got its end from fertilizer and the soil. So I, I model what the soil might supply from mineralization. See, I mean, it supplies quite a bit. But it's going to supply enough to grow really high yields. This gap has to come from fertilizer. That's pretty challenging, and the question is, you know, what are we going to do to make sure we use fertilizer better, right, so it's not lost? How, how, but, but by having those nutrients available, and by gosh, it comes down to the right source, right time and place. I mean, this is so blasé. It sort of sounds like the four R's. Well, it actually is the four R's. Genius, if you think about it. All of these are important. I'm going to focus on placement, because that's the most important of all. So let me, let me, I just showed you this peak uptake thing. What if I could place the end there, right? To make sure it's available for peak uptake. That'd be a good deal, wouldn't it? Not only might I not have enough for peak, up, peak uptake, but I also might have enough left over to slow that remobilization on the back end. Placement. Why is fertilizer placement so important? It has to do with the horizontal spread of each corn plant's root system. The horizontal spread of each corn plant's root system is only six to eight inches. I know, because my students have dug up lots of roots. God, they love it. There's nothing they'd rather do than dig up roots. This is the horizontal spread of a corn plant's root system near the end of the season, standard density. And see this thing right here? This is an expensive scientific instrument called a rulerometer, and we can quantify that spread. Notice six to eight inches. So I got roots four inches on one side, four inches on the other side. Here's the biggest misnomer of all time. Roots do not cross the row. I mean, maybe they used to 50 years ago, but they don't now. Just dig them up to ask my students. I, I know you've seen pictures of corn roots. They're two foot wide three foot deep. That's called a tree. It's not a corn plant. They, they only expand about six inches. Huh. Think this isn't why I need to place fertilizer better? Let me ask you another question. This is related to nitrogen. When, when nitrogen moves in the soil, how, how does it predominantly move? Does it predominantly move vertically? That, that's the scientific term for down. Or does it move to the side? By the way, nitrogen moves predominantly down. I know it can move sideways, but the great movement is down. Now, look, and I can show you this. I can show you an example of this. So this is a field, 80, 180 pounds of pre-plant pre end. And then I got seven inches of rain in late May and early June, you know, bye-bye end, downward movement. You can sort of see it there. But see this row right here? This row had an extra in-season side dress, 80 pounds, put right there along the row with a Y drop. That's where I'm pretty sure the root is. Notice how it's greener? Now, now let me ask you this. This is the summary here. If the root only expands six to eight inches horizontally, and if nitrogen moves down and not sideways, where would the better place be to put a side dress application? Would it be better to put it here or there? I, we've tested that happily. We got the research rig to test that. With this equipment, we can test whether it would be better to culture it down the middle or to wide drop it along the side. So I'm, I'm going I'm to briefly show you this experiment. This leads into our NREC uh, experiment. This is with Brad Bernhard. And what we did, um, again, across the side of Illinois, two years, uh, we used uh, 180 pounds of nitrogen. Urea broadcast all up front, 
or we broadcast half of the reel up front, and then we did different ways to side dress the other half. So half up front or all up front, different ways to side dress the other half. This is sort of what it looks like. You know, there's the top dress, there's down the middle, there's the, uh, there's the Y drop. And we also had a no nitrogen control. That's called the check plot. And the check plot tells us what the soil supplied. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you these six site years with check plot first. What did the soil supply? No nitrogen. And man, there's some pretty good yields. So look at this check plot. No end at all. Raised from 97 bushels to 224. And here's something interesting. The site with the highest and the lowest check plot was the same. And it's that southern Illinois site. Man, is this a challenge, because one year the weather can release lots of that, and the next year not much end. This is what makes this so difficult. Now, now being scientists, what we want to do is, you know, characterize stuff, right, divide things, put them in groups. So we put these into two groups. What we call the low check plot and the high check plot, using a line eye orange and blue. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you the yield. I'm already showing you the check plot yield. But now I will show you what the yield was. I'm going to get to average it over the, the locations. I'll show you what the yield was uh, uh, from putting 180 pounds on up front. So there, again, there, there's the check plot. I got in parentheses. There's the yield from 180 pounds broadcast. Um, and man, you can see there, there's, there's some cases where it's 100 bushels. But mostly it's you know 40 to 70 bushel that we get from nitrogen. So they're all responsive then, even with a high check plot. Now I'm going to show you what the yield was from the different side dress. And I'll compare it to the upfront broadcast. So I'm going to show you, you know, how much, what the bushels is when, when I only put half of it on up front and I side dress the other half. And we side dressed it different ways. And I know this is a lot of data. Um, and I'm showing it as a difference from the upfront urea. So again, um, negative means uh, side dress decrease yield, by the way. So what notice, notice any trends here? Look at the blue ones. Look at the ones with the low check plot yield. If I had a low check plot yield and I only put half the end on up front, side dress the other half, I lost yield. And I lost even more yield if I put it right down the center. Well, I'm pretty sure there's no root there. You know, it's moving down, not sideways. But look at the sites that have the high check plot yield. If I had a high check plot yield, then I actually responded positively to the side dress and the Y drop was the best. All right, the Y drop being the best doesn't surprise me, but this is really counterintuitive. This tells you that that plant must see a certain amount of nitrogen right from the very beginning. And if I got a low check plot, it doesn't see it from the very beginning unless I broadcast 180 pounds of N. It's the, you know, it's got to see some from the very beginning. Now here's the question, how much does it need to see from the very beginning? That is our NREC project. So that's what Dr. Winans did. So what I'm going to show you is uh, about three years, three locations. So the, the standard years. And, and at each of these sites, what we did is we varied the ratio of upfront to side dress. So uh, either we put a quarter of it up front, the rest side dress, three quarters or we did it half, half, three quarters, or we did it all up front, none side dress. And that up front was either broadcast or banded. The side dress was always done with the Y drop, so we used the best side dress. And then all of these treatments totaled 180 pounds of N, and I will show you, we did have a, a fertilizer check plot. And I know you're thinking, well, how on earth did you do this? This is, you know, with using liquid, this is pretty challenging. So here's how we did the broadcast. We got an RTV that's got RTK, and we put a student in the back. We're telling them on, off. Pretty accurate. You'd be shocked. Uh, and this is how we did the two by two. So what we're doing is we're, we're putting the fertilizer two inches down, two inches aside. It's got RTK. We're going to come back with that plant and plant two inches off to the, off to the side. So we had, if they worked perfectly, three locations, three years, should have been nine side years. Okay, but Mother Nature, you know how she is. She's pretty finicky. So I lost two of the sites due to weather events, in case you don't recognize. I learned a new term, the rancho. <laughs> I'd rather I didn't learn that term. But so I'm going to show you six site years of data. Uh, and uh, and I, I told you there was a no end control. So I'll show you that first. 
of, the, of, the, of what will be seven site years. And I've listed them here, again, according to their check marks. 65 year bushels to house, uh, two tons, three times. That's the variable soil supply. That's already a challenge. Then, then what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you the, uh, the, the difference between broadcast and bank. And I'm going to average it over all the ratios just to make it easier. So I, I put the, uh, the, the broadcast there. There's the bandit. Um, now, now you'll notice, uh, you know, in some cases there's a 100 bushel increase. In other cases, it's more like 60. Now, if you look at these numbers, I hope you can see that the bandit is generally higher than the broadcast. So I did the delta for you. And I used the green is good, you know, red is bad, right? Christmas colors, stoplight, and they're all positive. And some of them are statistically significant. Banding that fertilizer right up front, on average, increased yield seven bushels. Same amount, same amount of that. Now, the other question, this is the last question. The other question is, you know, how much of that end needs to be available up front? So, you know, again, I, I, what we did is we either banded, banded or broadcast this amount at planting, and then we side dressed the other amount. So I'm going to show you what the impact of the, of the upfront side dress ratio meant. Oh boy, this is a lot of numbers. I mean, talk about ugly. So I will summarize this for you. And I will tell you, you know, if you look closely at the banded ones by the pre-plant to nitrogen ratio or the broadcast, I'll just have to take my word for it, that the pre-plant to side dress ratio was way more important for broadcast than that. Now, if I broadcast it, you know, I generally needed to have a ratio somewhere here, right? So I had enough available, but it wasn't all subject to loss. Way more important than banded. So again, I want you to look at these, and I want you to say, well, let me compare the banded to the, to the side dress, and that's a lot of numbers, so I'll just do the delta for you. And that's what it looks like. That's, this is the difference between the banded and the broadcast at the various ratios. So remember, green's good, red's bad, a lot of green. Here's the cool part, here's the good news. Look here, all green. Some of those green numbers are pretty big. This means if I could just bend a little bit in planting, I could set the yield potential and then come back later with the side dress. And I can time that exactly right with peak uptake. All right, so I'm, I'm pretty sure this is going to minimize loss, give me higher yield. Now, I don't have time to show it all to you, but these are also associated with more nitrogen accumulation in the plant. So the good news is I only got a band of corner right. Set the potential, now I got versatility to come back later. All right, well I'm done now, but I have to thank my team. So uh, I got some of my students here, right, by the way. This is my current team. Uh, there's my assistant coach, Dr. Connor Sybil. You know how what assistants do, they always want to get their own head coach job. Yeah, he's being interviewed for the uh, Illinois Soil Fertility Extension position. Best of luck to him. There's Darby Danzel. Darby has a poster, and, and together those two got me to plant a car crop. You can believe it. So stay tuned for that. Let me thank the NREC and all the people that have supported my research. Couldn't do it without it. And since uh, you're a glutton for punishment and have shown the propensity to go to a field day, I'm going to invite uh, you to crop this day. Our laboratory field day, October 1. Out in the field, all of my students present. I'll have demos, swag, refrigerated restrooms. You know, I hope you are there. So, thank you so much.